Welcome back to the morning show here on Arise News, January 31st, the last day of the month. Brexit. <laughs> so we'll see proceedings how it goes today. Yes. I mean, it's Independence Day for Britain today, but hey, that's, it's a great day. My name is Rufai Sene. So globally, there's been climate change marches and strikes with protests that's carrying creative signs and placards to get their message across using costumes, dance, music, and other forms of artistic creativity. The engagement of the arts and the climate change transformation has increased in recent years, especially with the narrative of visual and performing arts. Well, beyond the mass protests, climate change has inspired artists to create works that express anything from people's fears to the scientific consensus around the issue. But are these artworks effective in getting a message across? What is the role of art in communicating climate change? Joining us now are two distinctive Nigerian artists, Oliver Enwonwo and Polly Alakija. All right, uh, Oliver Enwonwo is an artist, creator, and administrator, author, writer, publisher, and brand strategist, also the president of the Society of Nigerian Artists and the director of Omenka Gallery. And don't forget, he's the son of Ben Enwonwo, a famous Nigerian artist who did the work I did too. But while Polly Alakija is a British muralist and artist and children's book uh, author married to a Nigerian. It's uh, a joy to have both of you here to talk mm. about this. Uh, so Ben Wong's son, Oliver Wong, <laughs> is here with I mean, Mr. Oliver. Let me, let me, don't let me twist it all out, but Mr. Oliver, uh, pun, no pun intended. <laughs> uh, we'd like you to talk a little bit about this recent concluded event by the Ben Wong Foundation about, you know, mm. Uh, fighting climate change for arts, and, and we go on the conversation from there. Well, it's um, it's um, a collaboration with uh, Alliance Française, and we have it as a, a talk series, point of view talk series, which we have every month. And what we try to do, a point of view series, is that we try to bring in artists to speak with government, to speak with those in science, to speak in those in technology, because we want a broader view we don't want uh, art to just be um, something of uh, aesthetic value, but we want to show the relevance of art to society. And uh, climate change for us is a very important topic. And uh, we worked with Polly Alakija on that uh, particular talk. And um, when you see headlines like Lagos being submerged in 2050, then you get really worried and you ask, what exactly is happening? What are we doing as individuals you know, to you know, stop this uh, uh, deterioration of our planet as we see it. And uh, artists being visioners, artists being very creative people, always have creative solutions. And so we decided that it's a good time to bring in experts, to rub minds with the artists, you know, how can we, you know, play our own role in saving our planet. Okay. And Pauline, you know, okay. okay. I mean, you can answer and then I'll jump in. I'm sorry, what do you want me to uh, we're talking about, you know, the role, your work with uh, mm -hmm. Ben as regards yeah. this yeah. project. And when he floated the idea of um, that particular point of view, I kind of jumped at the chance to be involved because it's um, an area that's very close to my heart. Um, I also just want to, like, just touch on what is art and what is culture because mm. I think in this context it's quite um, important to look at the difference between the two. Um, if you talk to somebody off the street, average man on the street, what is art? They might say, you know, it's elite, it's not very relevant to me, I'm not interested. But when you talk about culture, people immediately understand culture is about who we are and how we live. Um, and so therefore it becomes relevant. So I think what I'm interested in with all, what Oliver's doing at Point of View is that it's making art relevant. Um, so in terms of relevance and impact and advocacy, let's look at it through the cultural space. Let's make sure what we're doing is relevant to everybody. Um, you know, in your introduction, you're talking about, you know, is this artwork relevant to me? Does it make a difference to me? So if we look at it more holistically and link it more to culture about who we are and how we live, then, yes, it is relevant to everybody. Um, climate change, yes, it's here and now and it's happening. It is real and... It's too late to play the blame game. Well, it's not our fault, so therefore we're not going to do anything about it. Mm -hmm. um, I'm a strong believer in the ability of every individual to be able to make a difference. You know, no matter who you are, um, you can make a difference, um, and almost you have a responsibility to take action as well. Definitely, I agree, and I uh, believe that one can't overemphasize the importance that art, the role that art plays in this conversation of climate change. Studies conducted at Stockholm University actually showed um, an increase in number of art projects related to climate change between 2000 and 2016. However, we find out that Africa 
is not up there with the rest of the world. Why do you think that is and how are we addressing that? Well, I think that uh, things are changing quite rapidly. On the Lagos art scene, for instance, you see a lot of artists embracing found material in their work, they're incorporating found material, materials that you find easily thrown away. We have artists like Rakib Basharun, we have artists like Adeola Balogun, we have artists like Murano Akim, we have artists like Olua Moda, Olumide Onodipa. These are leading artists who are beginning to use found material in the, in the environment, bringing them home. They have an environmental concern. So that's one way that artists you know, are beginning to change that narrative. Another way, for instance, artists are beginning to watch how they produce works you know, in their studios. They're being very conscious now, you know, watching their carbon emissions, watching to ensure that the materials they use you know, do not deter the environment even further. So I think that these are ways, and I think all too soon you'll find you know, that you know, culture in Africa will play a very impactful role you know, in changing that narrative. Absolutely. What do you think? Well, can you just uh, jump in there as well? Um, absolutely. Um, I'm always going on about education mm. and the need for awareness. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, we have an incredibly exciting art scene here and some extraordinary stuff happening in that space. Yet I still find a lot of our young artists do not have the exposure and the knowledge of the global conversations. Um, and who is educating those artists as well? Um, I work a lot with teachers and with young artists to help them become educators. And we've recently been working on projects in the climate change space. Um, there's two particular projects we've been working on. One is called My Story of Water, and one is called My Story of Energy. Mm. Um, and recently worked, was working, for example, was working with a, a team of about 10 young artists um, and talking about them working in schools with teachers and children in this, in this climate change space. Not one of those young artists or the teachers we were working with could explain what climate change meant to them, mm. could not tell me what extinction meant to them, could not say what global warming was, or um, um, carbon footprint was an interesting concept. They could not articulate it. So how on earth are they then going to unpack that when they're educating or unpack it in their artwork if they're creative artists? Um, one concept, fossil fuels. We talked about fossil fuels now, one of the teachers or young artists I worked with could actually really explain mm. what a fossil fuel was. Mm. So then how are you going to have those conversations about fossil fuels? Um, and <clears throat> what, what are you teaching young people? What are you expressing in your artwork <clears throat> if you can't explain that concept in the first place? So how can you talk about different ways of looking at it, mm. of making an impact, making a change, if you're that unaware of what's going on around mm. you? So education is, is very key. Mm -hmm. I mean, another very important part... Uh, of uh, that program was a conversation about um, putting our works on the international scene yes. and works that are done, <clears throat> sort of like climate works, like gathering bottles and the likes and yes. you know, taking those things off the street. And also your work with at Five Calories. I mean, mm -hmm. you want to start that conversation and you just said... At Five you conversation, Oliver? You mean about uh, works yeah, achieving, work, stabbing yeah. amounts in the yeah, international yeah, market? Yeah. Yes, um, you know, African artists, you know, um, they're very tactile. I think that's one thing that, uh, you know, differentiates when we work in Africa, especially West Africa. You know, our old processes that we've brought into the contemporary realm have to do with making, feeling, you know, have to do with uh, weaving. You know, that's how our forefathers have created art, I mean, from time. You know, so taking found material, we've always taken things that we could immediately grab in our environment. You know, African art is well noted for, you know, sculpture, you know, and when you think about the rainforest that we, we've always had, you know, because of our tropical climate, it's very understandable that you would see the sculptors of the old times, the carvers of the old times, you know, just go into the environment and fell a tree to make, uh, you know, something functional, because our art in those days was even more functional than, you know, what you would have to display, for instance, in, an exhibition hall. So it goes without saying that even in contemporary times that it will continue to th take things from the immediate environment. And what are these things? Items that have easily been thrown away, you know, old jerry cans, you know, mechanical parts, you know, and that for me shows that um, uh, concern with the environment. And um, presently, 
you will find many Nigerian artists, you know, achieving staggering amounts on the international scene for their work. You know, our work is very interesting because, you know, you, you find that uh, we've gone through a lot of experiences, you know, taking from our traditional yeah. ancestry, you know, merging that with contemporary times, the advent of Christianity, the Industrial Revolution, you know, Biafran War, for instance, the civil Nigerian Civil War, um, experiences from colonialism, all of that, all those experiences have been blended into our art. And that's why I think it's become so interesting that the world is looking, you know, at what we've been creating. And that's why our work is so enriched, you know, it's so enriched, you know. And I think that's the reason why, you know, we're grabbing those international and staggering them out at auction. Well, Polly, you want to come on that? Um, mm. on that well, certainly from the point of view of education and working with young people, um, gosh, there's so much to say about this. Mm -hmm. um, I was asked recently, you know, why don't we have an African Greta Thunberg? And I said, mm. well, back to the thing about culture, you know. Mm. Unfortunately, we have a culture where we're not encouraging young, our young to speak mm. and we're not really listening to the voice of the child. And at the end of the day, when we talk about climate change, we're talking about the future of the planet. We're not talking about how the planet's going to kind of be fine for Oliver and myself, yeah. but not for our children. So we need to listen to our youth. We need to listen to our children. Um, we need to not only listen to them, but we need to give them the tools to question the reality around them, to make references. And once they've questioned it, to imagine a different future and then to implement that and make that happen. And then in terms of, um, yes, putting that voice out there, when we now have our Greta Thunberg from this continent, um, let's put it out there. The world will listen. So um, through the five carriers, we're working very much using the arts in schools and bringing creativity in the schools to try and support our teachers and our young children to develop these creative skills and the ability to imagine a different future. Um, and luckily, the one good thing about arts and culture, it's cool, everybody loves it, and it looks good, so everybody wants to engage. And so we exhibit the results of that, um, both nationally and internationally. And last year, we had the um, um, opportunity to take the artwork that was created by some of the children we worked with and exhibited it on the South Bank in London. And we had two million physical visitors to that installation. So it's a conversation and a subject that the world is engaged with. I can't wait to have those figures from Lagos. I want to be able to say, oh, we exhibited this in Abuja or Lagos, and we had two million people come and engage with this exhibition. Trust me, your mural on the Falamon Bridge will have wow. been Trust million. me, I definitely more than two million. In December alone, probably about five million people. Um, but we're going on a, on a, on a break uh, shortly. But I want to talk about you know science communication because you know if we're talking about climate change, the people that you know, you've spoken about education, they understand the concepts. But the people at the, at the you know, dire end of this conversation are the scientists. So is there any collaboration between scientists and, you know, the, the people making this art? I want you to just think about that. We're going to go on a break, and when we come back, you would answer it. You're still watching Arise News. All right, we're right back and we're having a conversation with two great artists here, Oliver Wong and uh, Polly Alakija. And so you had a question for I mean, yes, before the break, I was talking about how we can or how you can um, bring scientists and artists to co-create work that helps communicate what climate change is. Because um, I, one reference I would actually like to um, spot here is the Sustainability in an Imaginary World project that happened in the UK. And they were able to almost highlight solutions in art, so people could connect to yeah. what the world would be in 2050 yeah. or you know 2060. So, is there anything like that with your? Yes, um, we're working on that. Uh, it has been a very interesting conversation for us. It's just the first conversation mm -hmm. of many more that will come. Uh, the foundation is very happy, pleased with the results because, you know, on that evening we had scientists there, technologists there, policy makers. Mm. So it was a very interesting conversation. And after that conversation. We intend to take it forward. Uh, we're looking, first of all, at the Lagos wetlands. The wetlands, you know, are very important because they hold the carbon and take it away from uh, the atmosphere. And when you look at um, the d deterioration of the environment, mm. you know, the wetlands can do a lot. Now, what are we doing to save our wetlands, for instance? That's the conversation that we want to have in a follow-up conference, you know, where we're going to have the scientists there, you know, to speak, because we've got experts on this, you know, and... Uh, 
Obviously, because we're an art uh, foundation, the conversation would also go revolve around the creatives as well. How can these two bodies of people come together with creative solutions, you know, preserving our wetlands? Because it's fast eroding. Yeah. And that is the reason for me, that's the reason especially why um, Lagos might be submerged in the next 30 or 40 years. Oh, yeah. Well, they always like to <laughs> we want you to chime in, as always. <laughs> yeah, I mean, um, we all talk about um, this acknowledged fact that yeah. um, Lagos, I believe, is one of the six most threatened cities in the world, coastal cities in the world. So we, we kind of put that fact out there, but it's very hard for us to back it up with scientific data. And this is something that came out at your um, event was... We have an issue with data collection in this country, oh, yeah? So it was awesome to have representatives from Unilag um, who are working in that space and collecting data and working on it. But we need to get to a point where that data is open and accessible to everybody. So, you know, when we like throw these concepts out there and these scary um, um, predict, pre projections out there that we've, we're backing it up with science. Um, we absolutely need to get science and the arts working together more closely. Um, you know, what we do through our little arts education initiative is trying to get people to use their imagination to imagine a better future. But actually, you need to base that on facts and the here and now. Um, actually, when I work with teachers, um, they very quickly get the connectivity between arts and science. And a lot of our teachers actually find it much easier to bring creativity into the classroom through their science lessons. So we have a very easy vehicle to bring those facts and data together, together and bring it down to basics and educate people about it. Um, you know, um, of course, I'm European, or I was European. I'm now British. <laughs> From this evening, and I'll be British, so like, I reference Leonardo a lot. Also because everybody loves Leonardo da Vinci. And what was Leonardo? Was he a mathematician? Was he a scientist? Was he an artist? He had an engineer. He was an engineer. He had this incredible imagination. So one exercise I do with children is following on from Leonardo's science experiments. Um, and his science experiments lead directly into his creativity. You know, the science experiments he did, you see them reflected in all his creativity and ends up in his paintings and his sculptures and yeah. his war machines. Yeah. Um, and a lot of that, I mean, he did so much work looking at wind power, the power of waves and what is a wave. So, you know, that whole concept of what is a wave Discuss that with teachers and children and you get some very interesting results. So, yeah, we try and bring science and art together as much as possible, but we all really suffer from a lack of concrete data. And, and it's, it's quite very apt what you said, because when you look at the life of Leonardo and what he stood for, most of the inventions we have today, Leonardo, no, he only created it. The oh, helicopter was the first to draw helicopter. the helicopter. Mm. You know, and he was... He also painted a sister in chapel. We forget that a lot. And Michelangelo. And Michelangelo, beg your pardon. Michelangelo painted a sister But we forget yes. that a lot, the great work he did. Even you know, anatomy as well. The anatomy, the, the what is it called, man, uh, the, the dissection of the human being, yes. uh, as it were. But what we are trying to do now in society that I don't think we're doing enough is to sort of like marry, have mm. scientists that are artists. Yes. How can we yeah. make more artists of scientists? <laughs> <laughs> I, think, I think it's an endemic problem because uh, we've got uh, universities teaching more theory and because the economy is in a very poor state, what happens is that those who come out after studying, who graduate after studying science and technology, they come out of the streets and look for a job in a bank because they need to put food on their table. Mm. So they don't try, for instance, to start putting what they've learned in theory into practice. And that's the reason why we're still importing things as opposed to manufacturing and being innovative and creating things. Mm. Uh, one thing I'd like to talk to you about real quickly, uh, here we'll be wrapping up this very soon, yes. is the power of art for other causes. And, mm -hmm. and, yes. and real quickly, I mean, there are two causes I know very dear to you. Have. Number one, uh, the Cowrie Park, where you put uh, single-use plastics, jerrycans and the likes. And secondly, the Falamo mural. A lot of people don't know oh. that was you. Those paintings on the Falamo Bridge, definitely is poly like it's like. Can you just tell us the story and how you use art for social change in that regard? The Falamo first. <laughs> you want me to talk about Falamo? Uh, okay. Quickly, okay, very briefly. Um, 
I'm passionate about urban regeneration. I'm passionate about ensuring that our cities become happier, friendlier, um, more prosperous cities. Um, you know, we have over 20 million people in this city. What is the quality of life like? And what can we do to our city to make the quality of life better for everybody? So urban regeneration, but putting communities and culture at the heart of it is very passionate. Mm. Um, it's a passion I have. Um, and so when I was looking at the Fallonmore space or considering the Fallonmore space, I used to work in an office that overlooked Fallonmore. So I used to wonder, you know, what could we do in this space? Um, the Fallonmore roundabout space is right next to the barracks there. So really, let's face it, this is a space that should be made accessible and usable for the community. So, you know, the actual what should happen in this space was an easy um, answer to come up with. The visual language um, was more challenging. Um, and I tried to, I talked to as many people as I could about, okay, what is the history of Fallonmore? What does Fallonmore mean? So I kind of went around in circles somewhat. Um, and then um, the Chibok girls um, were kidnapped. And immediately there were images, when they were kidnapped, they bring back our girls, um, put images of the girls up on the roundabout. And um, I remember it was beginning of the rainy season and the images were like washed away and um, I have four kids and I have three daughters and I remember thinking that if that had happened to my daughters I'd want the suffering and the loss and the pain to be represented in a more respectful way and then got me thinking more about um, the suffering of women generally and the social silences around women you know women are at the heart of our communities um, I talk about women being the pillars of strength so kind of then stretched that narrative to include all women who do not have a voice. So I kind of like reference, like the, um, reference it as my um, silent choir of women. Um, but then what's interesting about that space, back to the international conversations, um, you did mention that, you know, how many people see that on a daily basis? Yes, a lot of people do see that on a daily basis. But more than that, the story's gone global. Um, so no matter where I go in the world, actually people know about that space and that story. Mm. So yeah, art travels, art is a, a universal language um, and some of these conversations are completely global and we can all connect with them. Um, so I think it's time for our artists to find a bit of courage and not be and, so and silent. Let me quickly go to Ben and relate that. I mean, Oliver. Ben, I'm, I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> Oliver. <laughs> yeah. Let me quickly go to Oliver and relate that because I was going to talk about the Ben work. Okay. I mean, the rich cultural heritage of your father's work, Ben Wall. Mm -hmm. I mean, I did you too. And see how it's transgender. You want to talk along that line too. I mean, she's seen. I just was sort of like a social change walk because I needed to show that an African woman can be beautiful, yes. can be accepted worldwide, and she is a queen. Yes. That's the first of its kind, even before Tufi had an African queen. <laughs> I agree. Oh, long before. Long before. <laughs> long before. You want to talk us through that? Yes, I think that uh, Benoit was very important in the sense that before him, and even till date, no African artist you know, has gone into our consciousness like that. And taking on from what uh, Polly said, it's even now, more than ever, because of the advent of technology that artists can be at their most powerful and influential, it's because with the touch of a button, they can get their messages out there. When they work with scientists, work with uh, social media, work with even media houses, you can imagine how powerful their imagery and how much they can influence these present times. Uh, going back to um, Aditu too, um, she was a granddaughter of the Oni of Ife at the time. Okay. Um, he met her when she was very young and he was immediately struck by her beauty. Now, since the 1930s, 1940s, and one had been very interested in pushing that philosophy of the black race, you know, um, negative philosophy that was espoused by uh, Leopold Seda Senegal, who Senegal. went on to become yeah. the professor president of Senegal. President of Senegal. Uh, they were all about black emancipation, black liberation, and it was more about judging a man from the content of his character and the merits you know, of his work and not by the color of his skin. Mm -hmm. So that was the narrative at that time. And through his works, you know, through Negritude, because uh, everyone painted a whole series of Negritude paintings which uh, spanned uh, his almost 60-year career, um, it was very important for him to show that the black man was at par with anybody all over the world in any mm. profession. You know, Tutu painted in 1973, there were three iterations of uh, Tutu, and uh, this served, you know, that time we had just come out from the Nigerian Civil War, this served 
to unite, you know, um, the different tribes of Nigeria at that time, you know. And I, like I mentioned earlier, there's no artist before him until now who has been able to merge indigenous Nigerian and African aesthetics with Western cultures, Western forms of representation, mm -hmm. you know, in his art. And for me, that's the essence of his greatness, mm -hmm. the messages he was trying to show, how he was able to bring society together through his work. All right, well, let's say a big thank you to you both, you know, for coming to share this great, you know, historical antithesis and also... Polly and Lucky Jacks uh, to join having both of you here. Yeah, thank you so much thank for being our guest this morning.